by a, a book published in 1700s by a naturalist called Carl Linnaeus. Uh, mm -hmm. He is literally like the father of the like modern uh, ways of classification. So like the father of taxonomy. The, mm -hmm. the book itself, the original book itself was called Sistema Naturae, which uh, it's funny because I just like try to went opposite and in invented my Latin word for artificialis, like artificial system. Ah, you invented system. that. <laughs> yeah, it's not really like a word. So I, I what I do here is uh, it's mm -hmm. like it, the idea of the whole book is trying to go around how I'm in the landscape and how we perceive the landscape, right? Mm -hmm. So I try to I try to go photographically, showing some uh, of the objects that I encounter. And mm -hmm. I at the beginning we go like with big, bigger photos, and then we go like smaller for, for like photos to like encourage the viewer to just go down and look at them. That's uh -huh. that's because it's more or less how when we're in the landscape well that's how it works right it's looking for objects mm -hmm. so uh the whole book encompasses like man-made uh, uh objects and like man's alter landscapes mm -hmm. um let's just go ahead a bit while i was photographing i was also collecting a lot of objects uh natural and artificial alike Mm -hmm. uh, which will I'll show you uh, after in the book. Uh, mm -hmm. They start to become more obvious, and like I start to uh, show them. And this is how it starts. So this is like a mammoth molar, actually, mm -hmm. uh, that I found on the river. It's, mm -hmm. It was all photographed around Savannah River. So it's one of the most richest places on for history in the in the southeastern United States. Because mm -hmm. it's full of places in fossils, uh, mm -hmm. so we have there like mammoths, uh, horses, extinct or giants, giant slots and stuff. Mm -hmm. So going through the photographs and like to the, I started to show you the objects like in a formal manner. So I started like to juxtapose the object itself. So you have like the circle and you have maybe a circle in the other photograph. So the what. Actually, uh, beside the objects being found on the places where the photographs were made, they also yeah. become kind of connected because of their formal qualities. Yeah, that's uh, something very interesting and it's something that you seem to be playing a lot in the graphic design of the book. Exactly. Like formatting. And also like playing like that image that you're showing us right now is quite interesting also because we are so used to see the landscape format for landscapes, right? Exactly. And I feel like you're exacerbating the, the possibility to read vertically, like, and to play with that, so, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's completely true. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, part of this project is that it's, it also includes, like, Polaroid photographs, instant film of mm -hmm. uh, taxidermy animals. Mm -hmm. They're all taxidermy animals depicting uh, the animals that should inhabit this uh, landscape, right? Mm -hmm. But because of human disturbance, there's there's been, like, uh, diminished on them. So there's like a computer chip uh, juxtaposed with like a, a beetle. They have mm -hmm. like really similar colors, really similar size, mm -hmm. uh, like a fossil uh, shark tooth with like a like a really eroding clip. As you could see, mm -hmm. it's really interesting because you could actually see what will erode faster. Like the mm -hmm. plastic is almost intact, but the metal is almost. Uh, it's it's really really like disintegrating. So uh, more or less, this is it. It goes, uh, in including mo uh, the, the Polaroids are in between. So it actually disrupts you from seeing the landscape. So you have to actually like just turn it. Uh, mm -hmm. There's some kind of, like all uh, some the other animals you'll see are mostly uh, in cages or mm -hmm. in a human environment. Uh, another. Part of the project is that I started doing like interventions in the landscape, right, with the mm -hmm. found objects. So for here, for instance, here, I, what I will mm -hmm. what I did was like I, I I put this chair on top of the of the of the of this tree, which is cut on purpose so uh, people that go into these nature trails can walk with like with ease, right? So there's no can we see that closer? That's really yeah. strange. Ah, yeah, yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. So so just the right part of the tree is cut so people can walk around it. Yeah. Uh, but the left part is like left 
uh, untouched in a way. So what I did is just put the the chair on okay. top. On top to accentuate right. that. To accentuate, yeah, yeah the, the idea of, mm-hmm. of human, um, the human made, right? So here are more objects. These are actually mm-hmm. fossils. So this is like a taper molar, an alligator, alligator skewed, like a, a llama uh, tooth, uh, mm-hmm. and a ray uh, spine. So, and I juxtapose it with like a, uh, like this is like, a keyboard from a computer against like a plastic shark tooth and stuff. Mm-hmm. The the photographs these big photographs that uh, every every now and then we encounter like a an orange page. Mm-hmm. We we chose this or this color to talk about how this m- mostly resembles like an artificial color that you it's it would be like really difficult to find this kind of color and the plasticness of it uh-huh. becomes like important. So it, it kind of changed the chapter. And we start with like black and white photographs from antique uh, uh, nature books that I photographed against like this uh, light backdrop. So we have like this idea of maybe water shining on top of them. So you see like kind mm-hmm. of like ripples. Mm-hmm. And the chapters of the book are kind of divided also like ecosystems. So there we have like more, more of a water environment against like the marshes. So we have like more water species. Uh, Mm-hmm. On the on the polar roots, right? So they're all dioramas, and I think it's really interesting to talk about the idea of uh, questioning the modern taxonomy, because uh, literally on the 1700s, that's when uh, humanity, well, mostly mainly uh, Western minds societies, started mm-hmm. thinking about nature in a way uh, as not part of uh, our. Ourselves, like not not part of our species mm-hmm. and the idea of like we a species that classify other species into families and genus uh, mm-hmm. becomes really interesting for me because it's in a way it does uh, speak about the disconnect we are currently living mm-hmm. nowadays uh-huh. yeah so these are like horseshoe crabs there aren't, aren't they're actually not crabs at all they're more related to arachnids and like scorpions mm-hmm. and these species have been unchanged for millions of millions of years and it's really interesting because they're, they're really in danger right now on the uh they only live on the atlantic coast of uh in north america and uh, some other species like in japan mm-hmm. but they're uh they're being exploited because of their blood so like people would like just collect them extract the blood because it's used for uh anticoagulants for medicine mm-hmm. and they would like just return them to the wild like without half of their blood on them and they will just just an interesting comment on that on those animals i mean we're talking about uh this is a gigantic animal this is an animal like correct me if i'm wrong but like this size at least like it could be it could be actually bigger uh-huh. like this is uh okay, an, exos- an, ex- an exoskeleton of one it's this mm-hmm. is like a medium-sized one so it's Mm-hmm. Uh, so they actually shed their their exoskeleton like most of the like most of the uh, not like uh, invertebrates, right? So they they shed mm-hmm. it to become bigger. That's why I have it. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so they're like really big uh, uh, antique creatures are are really on the brink of extinction because uh, human mm-hmm. uh, interventions, right? Mm-hmm. Here again, playing with the formal uh, references of the of the book and the objects that I found. Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, here's like so. So tell us about from. yeah. Tell us about the idea of putting this in the shape of a book. I did it meant for you to work with the book format and you know. It's actually. It was, it's just it was, to tell people, it's just to contextualize people, because you haven't shown us yet. But his work also has a lot. I mean, he works a lot with like real objects, installations, like objects he intervenes, and also photographs exactly. that he hangs. You know, like photographs that he hangs on the wall. So it's interesting that uh, for this project he chose to do a book, which is anyway. Please, it, it's really interesting because I think photography works a lot, uh, really well in a book. 
right? Mm -hmm. it, it, it works in a wall, it works in, a, in another like uh, material, but mm -hmm. as a book, I think it becomes more tactable, right? So you have mm -hmm. to go through it and actually see the photographs and work around what you're looking at and like the touch mm -hmm. and the change of the, of the, of each page becomes, it becomes kind of like a narrative. It could, you could work around with that with photography. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it was interesting to talk about this. And it's, it's nice that you, you say it because all the objects that I'm showing are actually after became uh, like an exhibition, like a vitrine. So mm -hmm. I think I, I, I could actually show you a bit of that. Sure. So most of the objects that I found afterwards became kind of like a vitrine, right? Mm -hmm where I, I uh, again, talking about modern taxonomy and how we tend to classify or give importance to objects, like mm -hmm. in museums, right? Uh, mm -hmm. uh, for me, uh, like natural history museums or like col uh, natural history collections are really important for my practice because they mm -hmm. uh, accentuate, I try to accentuate uh, the, what I see into like a more uh, uh, banal way of showing. I don't know how, how, how would I say it, but like, for example, the. This piece in the middle is like a fossil from a mammoth. Mm -hmm. And then we have, it's like, it's it's with like a 1950s uh, Coke bottle, but also it's, it, it also, it, it also comp composes like one of the, like the biggest sharks that ever existed. It's like the Megalodon tooth that I found there too. So it's mm -hmm. like a, a millions of years of history intertwined into just one uh, composition. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and for me, this is really interesting because these are the objects that I was finding while I was walking, right? So I, I didn't have to look much. Obviously, I went to like specific places, but uh, the mm -hmm. objects themselves were all like living in the same like strata, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, going back to the Anthropocene, I believe like many of our objects, like these artificial objects are accumulating in the landscape. Uh, do start to become a uh, part, like a uh, part of an evidence of humanity's past through through the time. So mm -hmm. um, it's really uh, going back to the Anthropocene again. I was saying my project in System Artificialis. Uh, I there's like three main proposals from when the Anthropocene started. So uh, one is when the like, first nuclear bombs uh, went off because mm -hmm. like the radio nucleus of, uh, of of the atoms can be traced all the way to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. So there's like this timeline that, that if you go, like you just excavate a bit, you could say like, oh, this happened like uh, 50, 60 years ago. So mm -hmm. uh, it's really it's really impressive that as a species we've created this uh, line that it's already part of the layers of Earth that are, uh, yeah. you know, it's, 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 I mean, it's funny and it's not. Yeah. Uh, so uh, the other one is with, with the industrial revolution, when our technology started to become uh, stronger towards shifting the landscape towards our own needs and mainly like capitalism, right? But mm -hmm. for this project, I consider a, 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 um, a proposal that it's not really, uh, not, not mainstream. It's a proposal mm -hmm. that it starts after the last glacier era. So mm -hmm. the Anthropocene started thousands of years ago when huma humanity started like uh, shifting from nomadic uh, places to um, to being more sedentary and becoming like farming around. So, mm -hmm. me, like most of the, it's really interesting because most of the most of the continents used to have like lots of megafauna, like you could find like elephants in Africa or Asia. Uh, Americas, like as a continent, it used to have like four or five different species of elephants that went extinct. Uh, right when humans like crossed the, the Bering Sea and started like living off the land in this new uh, mm -hmm. continent, right? So for me, it's really really interesting to incorporate that dialogue into my project, and that's why I also include like fossils because they become kind of like evidence of our past as butchers, so, like eating mammoths, like, mm -hmm. driving lots of species to extinction, which is really really sad in a way. Uh, Absolutely. Well, yeah, more or less, it, that's, that's a bit uh, system artificialis. Mm -hmm. And as you can see, like, uh, I, I really take like a phenomen phenomenological approach to like in, uh, in what's really important for, for my practice. Uh, and so it's like photography and what. So true photography and what. 
I get to touch to what I'm seeing and collecting the objects that I'm, that I'm finding, which then later I like work around my studio to. Uh, I love that you. I love that you list the walk as a um, as, um, as a technique, right? I yes, like it. I mean, photography and walking. I love it. No? Yeah. I th I think it's very smart, and I think that it should be considered an art technique. Walking. I mean, there's a lot of artists that incorporate walking into their practice, but the fact that for you this is like a capital part of your practice, I think, is very relevant. Yeah. Yeah, it, it is. Uh, it's some. It's, it's a way of like exploration. Uh, I, mean, I, mm -hmm. I consider myself like a naturalist, so mm -hmm. uh, I've always wanted to study like zoology. Mm -hmm. Never went there, but through my art now, I can kind of go towards it. Not in a scientific Absolutely. matter, but just like in a more personal or uh, abstract place, right? Where I can just work around the objects and. Uh, and Absolutely. There. Well, I think. I mean. At risk of sounding super cliche, um, there's the beauty of art that you can approach basically, and you know, like any kind of art, like writing, filming, that you can approach basically any topic in humanity, you know, whether it's something concrete or abstract, and deal with it, you know. So it's like you can't have multiple professions at the same time being an artist. Yeah. Especially now being a contemporary artist, perhaps like a hundred years ago, being an artist meant specifically to be either a sculptor or a painter, exactly. like contemporary art allows you guys to be able to do yeah, I think it, whatever. We're, we're, we're in a place where we can do like multitask or like mm -hmm. work around the other, other, like life doesn't have to go just one way, right? So it could be like mm -hmm. multiple layers that informs the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I was, uh, I don't know what you think, maybe I could also try to talk about uh, a project I did in Cuba. That would be uh, wonderful. Let's talk yeah. about the Cuba project, yeah. Okay, would so you like me to, to show the video or you let me know when you want me to show the video? Sure, uh, yeah, maybe, let me just maybe start with it and, uh, and then I will show the video and I start talking about what it sure. means, right? And maybe on the same time, so people don't see our faces, just I can show you also like photograph from the, from the, from the project. So you let me know and I'll start playing. Yeah, perfect. Uh, so there's like this uh, uh, exploration or uh, I embarked like in this uh, uh, exploratory trip in Cuba in 2008, 2018 mm -hmm. to find Ana Mendieta's uh, orchestral sculptures. So mm -hmm. Ana Mendieta, Cuban American artist, uh, uh, which she, she, her work has like influenced me a lot, not only mm -hmm. because of the idea of, of this creation of third body, but the idea of finding identity through the art, through the through the landscape. So mm -hmm. for me, it was really uh, I, I found about this pro this project a couple of years ago when I was in Cuba in Havana doing a residency uh, at the Fototeca Nacional. I I embarked on a, on a day of finding these impression sculptures. So Ana Mendieta in 1981, she created a, a, a group of works. Uh, like low relief, low relief sculptures on, on this national park called Escaleras de Jalco. And it was really interesting that she created it. And most of her work actually was really ephemeral because she would create it, uh, she would document it through photographs or videos. But then what? The aftermath of it, it would just not go back to the landscape. So it was really interesting for me to go and find these uh, eight impression sculptures uh, from mm -hmm. the uh, 80s and see what was of them. And Just a little bit of context for somebody in the audience that might not know Ana Mendieta. The interesting thing about what Ernesto is bringing up also about looking for identity is that Mendieta is an artist that was born in Cuba and had to um, like exile. I mean, she, wa she was exiled by her parents like on, on a plane without her parents and located into an American family when she was nine years old. And so, uh, for her, like uh, re like doing contemporary art was also a way to reach that identity. And then she was able to go back to Cuba. Like I think I don't know if the eighty one trip is the first one, but like she doesn't go to back to Cuba until the late seventies. So it's sure. a very uh, tricky emotional like experience for her to reconnect first with her Latin Latino identity, her first trip to Mexico, and then with Cuba, and um, just. To, to give context to what you're gonna, yes. what your intervention, um, uh, what she ends up doing in these ruins, 
uh, of, and a lot of her practice way before she went back to Cuba had to do with like the Afro traditions of Cuba um, that she had learned growing up in Cuba. Um, so she incorporates like these like um, primitive designs, uh, so-called primitive That's designs. Yeah. And so she does them in the land where she took this iconography from. So it's very important for that reason. Anyway, so uh, he, uh, Ernesto, went to hunt for this original series, which we all know through photographs. Exactly. Uh, mm -hmm. So these are called the Lupestrian sculptures by Ana Mendieta. And mm -hmm. there's not online that says exactly where they are and I didn't find wow. anything. So I did like this uh, uh, this trip. Like I specifically uh, embarked on like uh, like this expedition, like adventure wow. like, to find unamendated repression sculptures and see what was happening, right? Because there's and there's no documentation with, with their value with like her sister. There's nothing that says if they're still alive. If they were like still alive, right? Or like if they just eroded away. So mm -hmm. um, what I did, and I'll show you some of the photos, is I embarked on like this expedition. And, and like in Cuba, you don't have much of internet, right? So uh, mm -hmm. I, I had to do my research before. And I took with me one of the books of these professional sculptures so I could show people and see if they knew uh, what the where these sculptures were. So I, I, I left Havana around 9 a.m. and got to the park, which is like a 40 minute drive, supposedly. I got to the park at like 5 p.m. Because like our car broke down, uh, like the, we got lost, crazy thing. We get there and the park is closed, but we decide just to go through. Uh, it, that, and that, like, like that saying like me and Roberto, which was the guy what, who took me. Mm -hmm. And so we, we went there and we felt a first encounter like this. So it's wow. really, really, really interesting and weird sculpture in beside this restaurant, yeah. just in the middle of the park of Escaleras de Haruk. So uh, after, uh, after like talking around with the pe people that were like, uh, the restaurant was already closed. So I talked to a woman who was like uh, cleaning up and, and, and asked about Ana Mendieta. She said like, she'd never heard of her. And then I, and, uh, but there might, her, his, her husband might know about her, but her husband was like sleeping. So it was really, um, it, it took me a while to like wake up the husband, which his name was Gerardo. And he like actually was a bit, uh, he wasn't happy about being woke up from his siesta. <laughs> and and I, I convinced him to take me to Ana Mendieta's uh, sculptures. And he said like, no one has been there like in six years. The last, last people wow. who asked were like six years ago. But the, and the, there weren't all of them complete. So mm -hmm. just a little bit of backdrop right now is that I, I after like this expedition, I just, just uh, while I was doing this expedition, I had in mind uh, Don, uh, Donna Haraway's uh, book, uh, Making Keen in the Kutlu Scene, which Donna Haraway is an American artist that uh, uh, questions the idea of the Anthropocene and why we shouldn't be naming the Anthropocene because it's so anthropocentric to name an era after just us. So she asks, she <laughs> talks about, uh, this uh, idea of tentacularity, like mm -hmm. taking um, life uh, into a more tentacular society. So I was seeing the roots and the branches of the trees as tentacles in some way while I was like walking towards the, 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 the cave. Um, I was really interested in, in this because I'll show you the name of the title of my video is called uh, A Ketonic Becoming. And mm -hmm. ketonics are uh, these underground fiction creatures that have tentacles and feelers are so aware of their environment, which Donna Haraway uh, uses on, on this metaphor of becoming, uh, uh, instead of anthropos, in the Kutlu scene, right? Mm -hmm. So after walking like 20 minutes in, in, the, in the jungle, uh, the Gerardo tells me like, there they are. And I'm like, okay, where? So I actually see the big one, right? So this is one. It's like a female body carved into like the limestone of, of the wow of the mm -hmm. of the cave, and then right at the end there's another one. There's, mm -hmm. I don't know if you can see like more. Of it, I like can here. see it now. So she, it's it's uh, uh, they're called the the one on the on the background. It's called uh, Moroya, which means moon in Taino, because mm -hmm. as you said. Uh, 
Mana Mendieta, going back to her culture, like to Cuba, she took a lot of like Afro Cubanism and like Taino cultures, like there were like mm -hmm. indigenous uh, uh, cultures that uh, inhabited the uh, Antillas. Mm -hmm. So it was really interesting to to find these in, uh, and like walk around them. And this is where the videos uh, started. So that's maybe you can play the video and can, I could just walk around the idea mm -hmm. of that. So what I did is like I set up my tripod. Uh, first of all, I told Gerardo if I could, I, I was fine here and I could just be by myself in the cave and mm -hmm. try to like uh, absorb the energy and the, the, the this amazing find because it was for me like it was amazing to think about these modern era petroglyphs made by this amazing uh, Cuban artist. So encountering that was like really, uh, it was inspiring and, uh, uh, and beautiful. Mm -hmm. So what I did is I started uh, I, I started filming myself in in the cave. It's a mm -hmm. really short video. It's like two minutes, and it's constantly played on a loop. Mm -hmm. uh, Let me try to show it. Do you want me to try yeah, to yeah, show it? Yeah, sure. Let's see. We're doing an experiment here, a technical experiment. But I think if I do this, so what we're seeing is actually like a, uh, a still from the video. Uh, and I think I am showing. Let's see if it's coming up on my screen. Yeah, it's it's okay. So we can we can see Bacayu there, which is the most like Lucero. And it's really interesting. This is how it looked originally. So it's it, it used to have like these drawings on it, were like made with cart uh, like uh, worn wood. So mm -hmm. it's still retains the form, uh, mm -hmm. but it, it has eroded away. So it's really interesting to to see how uh, a couple of years after it, it it's still there. Mm -hmm. So what I, what happens in this video is that I walk around and uh, naked uh, in the landscape, uh, you. Yeah. Think, thinking about how Ana Mendieta also uh, and her practice and, and in, in a way, a ketonic becoming. So mm -hmm. for me, this walk into the cave, uh, it's, it, it makes references of me trying to become this ketonic one, this underground being uh, uh -huh. are surrounded by these maybe ketonic goddesses that were, uh, that Mendieta created. So following uh, Donna Haraway's proposition of becoming a, a more, uh, like a more feeling society, a, a more decentralized society where uh, we are aware of our environment and we are aware of uh, our, the species that uh, we coexist with. Uh, mm -hmm. I, so I, I, I do this incursion into the cave, which I don't think it might show in the video you're showing right now, but I disappear in the cave and then come back again. So I disappear around here and then will always appear here. So it's like a constant loop that it's in and out. Uh, mm -hmm. So, trying to uh, reinforce the idea of becoming a catonic one. There you appear again. There's something I, very, it's a pity because I don't think I can remove myself and I think I'm interrupting your beautiful intervention on the landscape <laughs> no, with my own body. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, I like the layers, the palimpsest of, of versions of <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's, it's, and it's human, kind of like, and a, like kind of like a collage. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's amazing. I think it's very interesting. I, I mean, this idea of like including yourself into this landscape and 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 also walking, like you said. yeah, exactly. Go, going again into my practice, like right? it's like mm -hmm. I go through it, I walk it, I experience it, mm -hmm. and that's how I absorb the uh, the um, the the landscape, the place, the things I encounter. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So, after coming out of this video, I, I did a, uh, a series of Polaroid images where mm -hmm. I photographed the what I thought might be the vestiges of the other rock Western sculptures. So mm -hmm. the, these Polaroids are actually titled uh, the Ketonic Beings, and mm -hmm. I take uh, and, I, and I include uh, every aspect of the of the caves that that I find have like anthropomorphic features that could be like these ketonic beings that I encounter in my fictional 
entering of the of the cave or uh, ketonic ones mm -hmm. that uh, Ana Mendieta created uh, uh, mm -hmm. 30 years ago. And this is uh, this is Moroya. This mm -hmm. is how it looked, right? Like when I took it, and this is how it actually looked when Ana Mendieta did it. Ah, I think. It's really, it's really interesting. It's like all, all the black disappeared, but most of the features still are still intact. Mm -hmm. So I started photographing uh, all these ketonic beings and, uh, that I encountered and I actually found some of the all other uh, sculptures that are eroded away. So if you cl look closely, there's actually mm -hmm. like this trace over here on the, on the rock, which is like mm -hmm. the head of one of the other uh, goddesses that Mendieta created. Um, mm -hmm. And then I took a self-portrait too, to include me as uh to think about this i'm um, considering myself one of these ketonic beings after going through like this experience of walking in the cave uh, that is great so so this is it and then i also found really interesting like a graffiti mm -hmm. that someone did there it's also like this uh uh alien ish uh female intersexual being that's that amazing apparently that has been there for a while now, and probably some other pe person uh, that went into the cave to find Mendieta's left his, his mark, her mark there. Can I ask you something? So sure. this, I think his name was Gerardo that guided you through the cave. Did he receive a lot of people looking for her, or did people just went to those caves because they are a touristic? It's it's a, it's, on their own? It's, it's, uh, it's it's interesting because it's a it's a national park. So it's called mm -hmm. Escaleras de Haruko. It's called Stairs of Haruko, and stairs because it, it's full of mountains. So mm -hmm. it's full of these limestone mountains that uh, were that and full of caves where Mendieta mm -hmm. carved the, the sculptures herself. So mm -hmm. what 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 is it's it's really big, really really big. So there's like I don't know maybe three thousand different caves systems mm -hmm. and not all are accessible. Like for example, Ana Mendieta's cave is not really accessible. There's no sign towards it. You get to like this little uh, brecha, I uh, forgot it's like this uh, uh, yeah, like little, almost uh, almost like a non-existing trail in the in the mm -hmm. in the jungle. So mm -hmm. this is kind of, kind of what the landscape looks like. So oh, it's full of like palm trees and uh, caves. So Gerardo told me that uh, the last persons that went there to look for Ana Mendieta uh, was this woman, and it was like six years before me. Uh, uh, that it went through him because apparently he's one of the uh, like the rangers, park rangers uh, that wow. work and live at the park. So, uh, so it's really interesting to think. This is the close of Moroya. Uh, I find a really beautiful house which Ana Mendieta carved it. Uh, mm -hmm. And this is like a, a better photograph, not a Polaroid, of the actual like traces of the other Venus, right? Mm -hmm. So it's, it was really interesting for me. To, this is another one. The darker part in the middle, is, there's like this female-ish silhouette. I don't know, it's really hard, but it's here. So th these, these ones disappeared completely because rain and, mm -hmm. and like wind and everything that uh, eroded them. Mm -hmm. So after this is actually a photo of how it looked, because I got there mm -hmm. when the light was almost going. So you could see like one of the Mendieta sculpture back there. So, um, yeah, so it was really interesting because after coming that I started like noticing other stuff that I didn't notice while, 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 while I was going. So while I, while I was walking from the cave towards the restaurant, now by myself, I started still thinking about these tentacular things and like encountering little like critters or, Wow, and geckos, and like seeing the landscape kind of in a different way. Sounds a bit cliche, but it was it's true. So I started seeing also like the textures on the cave. So these beautiful orange colors on them. Uh, I would love. I want to make sure we have enough time. We have another twenty minutes. We're good about oh, sure. Instagram. Uh, it's cruel, and it will cut us off after an hour. And I want to make sure that we show our audiences, oh, those are beautiful landscapes, um, some of the real objects that you were with. Sure. And I want to go back to this idea that you show about showing objects in a train. Mm -hmm. I think it's interesting that if people can see the range of uh, possibilities that 
your work with landscape has. So to recap for anybody that joined us uh, more recently, uh, Ernesto is explaining his practice, which has to do a lot with uh, things that he would encounter while walking through nature. He goes through landscape and he encountered things. These things are not necessarily only natural things as we would assume. I mean, we have this like, you know, city fantasy about landscape being natural and the city being man-made. And mm -hmm. I mean, what his practice is showing is that it's actually much more complex and he talked about this idea of ruins, and these ruins can be man-made or natural. One of them is photograph and books, which is what we saw so far, um, like retracing the trail of another artist, like in the case of Mandieta, another way. And I wanted him to show us some of the other formats that his practice can take. Yeah, of course. I could actually take you like a little tour. Like most of my studio, uh, most of my studio, it's mostly like a cabinet of curiosities. So I have like these objects that I find and I arrange. So mm -hmm. more, I'm sorry because the light is against us right now, but these are some physical sculptures with made mm -hmm. with like objects that I found myself. Mm -hmm. So there's like a horseshoe crab uh, with mm -hmm. a Pepsi bottle that I found in the from the eighties. And then this, I also work with clay. So I created these uh, Venuses, intersexual Venuses mm -hmm. uh, from clay. Uh, Which in a way play with this idea of like the kind of drawing you would find in this like natural landscape. It, so it, I mean, yeah, exactly. So they, it's it, they 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 go through the dialogue with, and also with the idea of uh, Anna Mendieta's uh, Venuses, right? Mm -hmm. So I also work a lot with feathers. So mm -hmm. specifically, military uh, macaw feathers. The uh, it's a species of um, Mexican uh, macaw that lives in. And it's almost endemic to Mexico, but also like mm -hmm. going extinct. So what I'm gonna do is that I'll show you where all the, my other sculptures are. So I have like this little kind of showroom. <laughs> I suppose That's to, right. I'm, I'm supposed to be renting this place, but I just like keep on uh, adding my objects. So this is a horse conch uh, with, I'm sorry for the light. So this is how I kind of like work towards the objects that I find and create uh, these uh, sculptures out of them. Um, in a way, I think of them kind of like totems. Uh, mm -hmm. So they start to dialogue with each other. I have this, this is mostly my more new work, so it's like a, uh, a deer antler hanging from a latex tubing with mm -hmm. some uh, hibiscus dyed cotton. Mm -hmm. Some, some other ideas of uh, like now that I'm living in a city, I don't have many natural like quote quote objects. So I'm starting to work with branches and like vines that I encounter on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, this is also another one. So these are like uh, this uh, monarch butterfly that I found that already and covered it with uh, a resin. So it kind of becomes like a like a glass uh, object or like an artificial object itself. Uh, mm -hmm. juxt juxtaposed with like the Coca-Cola bottle, you know? like the, the trademark of capitalism. Uh, <laughs> and this is Which like, is that ruin itself also. I mean, in it's a way, right? Like it, it's kind of like something we find all the time in the city, in the, and in that the you find in the street. basically, yeah. But also in every any natural landscape that you go anywhere in the world, you will eventually run into a bottle or a, a can bottle. Of coke. Exactly, which is really interesting because yeah. they they, they were invented like a uh, hundred, mm -hmm. almost like 120 years ago. So these yeah. are newer ones that I'm trying to work around with, like ostrich eggs from a farm mm -hmm. in Puebla, mm -hmm. uh, and. And again, and this is like my collection of objects that are the objects that I use, I mm -hmm. find, and then I try to use them on my work. This is so amazing. And it's so amazing to see it display like this, because I mean, this is also not even the main room where you were planning to film this conversation. I mean, yes. it's a great testament of the way you work. When I visited your studio, it was also, you know, had all these beautiful objects, super classified, and I think it's interesting 
how you work. I mean, how this is part of your process. Um, I wanted to ask you to um, um, make sure before uh, we finish that you tell uh, people, I mean, not that I think that biography explains artists. I mean, I do know that you grew up like going into like nature expeditions yourself and like, you know, like, I mean, how did your relationship with nature evolve? I mean, before and after your artistic practice? I don't know if to be off a question, but. No, it, I think it makes, it makes sense. It's a really important question because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's a, like I grew up, uh, I, mm -hmm. I, 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 like if you ask me about culture, I wouldn't know. My family, used, we, we, took, we used to took me to like this place called the Temahak in like, uh, in, in Jalisco, where, like, where my state is like a forest area. And I, mm -hmm. I used to grow up there, I grew up there. So my upbringing was really around uh, hunting, which is really weird. Mm -hmm. My dad mm -hmm. loves, loves to hunt, hunting and fishing, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. uh, at the end, it makes sense because it kind of pushed me away from from that. And through my work, I started like uh, encapsulating those feelings that I had when I was younger about mm -hmm. hunting or fishing. Which uh, it's a it's a really complicated uh, thing because it, it's I find like really happy moments from it, but also like mm -hmm. uh, a bit of guilt too, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, it makes sense of what I'm doing right now because it it's, it talks all about how humanity and I include myself. It's uh, we're part of a, of, a, of a big issue right now that uh, has yeah. been like changing. So I don't know if I answer a bit of your question, but, but yeah, I think I, you I, need, I and I think the more the most interesting. Part of what you said, which I, I see in your practice, is that you're not offering any easy answer to it. You know what I mean? Because, which I think is important because I don't think there is an easy answer. Like what, you, what your work is saying, which I think has to do with your own personal experience and biographical experiences, you know, that yes, we humans intervene in nature and we've been damaging it, but at the same time, it's not like we can just stop doing it and then everything will be back to natural. I think, um, I mean, something that, um, that you, um, you know, that you must have noticed that makes, again, your work so relevant today is that one of the most like repeated news that we're seeing every day now is this idea of nature coming back, right? Yes. We're seeing this absurd like proliferation of articles in the news about like, oh, nature is regaining space yes. now that we are backing down and not walking around. And you, you see this most like absurd, I, I've been collecting some of them with a Park, you know, or something. Yeah, or or like the dolphins came back to Venice and they were never. <laughs> yeah, never Venice, been there. You know, so, like, yeah. and it's not true, and it's just not true. Um, so yeah, and it's, I, and it's funny. Yeah. Are nature, right? Exactly, we are nature. Exactly, and it never left because it's all around us. I mean, exactly. like I live now across the park and I see nature every day, and I see the raccoons, you know, and people sometimes want to engage with nature, but not the dirty part, like the raccoon or, you know, exactly. or the rats or the Yeah, the yeah it's, it's really interesting how uh, we, mm -hmm. uh, sometimes uh, we tend to like classify some animals as good animals we take care of and some other like, uh, <laughs> yeah. don't want to see you ever again. Yeah. You know? And I have a cat on top hey, of me while I say <laughs> so. That's nice. I actually also <laughs> can show you, I, I have a friend here. So it's nice. <laughs> Nice, I you go. I love it. Like, <laughs> nature taking back space. They're even exactly. taking up our Instagram live. My, exactly. <laughs> my non human companion in my studio. Exactly. I think it's so interesting. I think that this practice and this idea of observing the relationship in between human and the human and the natural is going to be so important in the time coming, you know, after it because. Um, I mean, first because of this fantasy of nature taking back and mm -hmm. this crisis and this idea, you know, but also because of uh, the way in which we're going to have to rethink the economical model, the agricultural model uh, that as a humanity we're having because it's basically what led us to this. I mean, we can yes. blame a bat, some conspiracy theorists talk about the land, but at the end it has to do more broadly about our relationship with nature and Anyway, yeah, that's, that's completely true, and it's really interesting because it, it. I hope, hopefully, we do reconsider the way we live, because yeah. uh, right now, like this uh, idea of staying home, and mm -hmm. 
like changing our way of life is mm -hmm. I think it's that it, it's that time to rethink the idea of how we're gonna come uh, like come to live again after this right so because mm -hmm. so, it's it's really it's really interesting to see how our ways of living has have changed and altered the landscape so much and have diminished uh, the natural resources uh, uh, and the biodiversity which is one of the most uh, important Absolutely. factors, right? So mm -hmm. that's, we need a healthy environment. We, we need a biodiverse environment in order to uh, avoid these kind of pandemics in a way too, right? Absolutely. But I like, you know, that I feel like your practice is a great example of how, uh, you know, a better environment doesn't necessarily mean like a purely natural environment. Yeah, true. I mean, not that we could even go back to that. Even if exactly. We to, you know? Yeah, it's, it's like I, non-existent. Yeah. No? Mm -hmm. And I like that you're highlighting, I mean, the elements of like, you know, if maybe we can show some more of, of your objects. Please. Sure. As we say this, but I mean, and, and in a way, as a beautiful, like visual conclusion of what we're discussing. I mean, this idea of, you know, the Coca-Cola. Like, yeah, the, the, the Coca-Cola on the country. This one is yeah. called the Endemic Studies. And it's, mm -hmm. it's composed of a Coca-Cola bottle that says Savannah on the bottom. It was it was uh, from the 1940s, and a conch mm -hmm. uh, that it's only it's endemic to the Atlantic coast of the United States. So in a way, Coca-Cola was found also in Georgia. So in a way, they're like uh, compatible because oh, wow. they were like they're endemic to, to the to the space. I also have like these paintings with objects and like taxonomies that I create from objects that, that I find. Yeah. Can you show them closer? So we sure. Can of course, of course. These are so so gorgeous. here we have mm -hmm. like a piece of glass, a moth, mm -hmm. a moth wing, and a, and a butterfly pupate that it never like exploded. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's like uh, pre-colonial pottery with mm -hmm. some like uh, buttons and like uh, metals, uh, mm -hmm. some orchids with some depiction of plants for, made of. Uh, Porcelain. Uh, this is mm -hmm. also like a monarch butterfly that I mm -hmm. found with like a piece of light bulb, a piece of coral, and like some amber. Mm -hmm. That is so fantastic. I mean, I think it's great to show this to people because this is like the 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 counter taxonomies that you're creating. You're taking this like taxonomy of humanity, you've been using that word so much, and at the same time, you know, like showing how that taxonomy of objects at the same time is a little bit absurd and, and and your taxonomy in a way seems more absurd but it's the most descriptive one i mean what you're showing there is what you would find on a walk through exactly. a yeah. natural landscape and half of the objects there are not natural that was exactly. so yeah, yeah. and uh, mm -hmm. historically we should be finding more mm -hmm. uh organic objects in our walks no exactly uh, but uh, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's really interesting that you say it because it's, I do feel uh, like these taxons are kind of like a, um, mm -hmm. a joke of modern classification of like appropriation of the objects that we uh, tend to collect in natural history museums and like give them like this value. They're also, but also they become like these cards you now from nature. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. Absolutely. I think if you agree with that beautiful thought and those beautiful words, let's just wrap up because, I mean, it was such a powerful reflection. Um, I don't know, um, before we leave, does anybody have any questions? Sorry. I mean, I got so enthusiastic about our talk that I forgot to ask people. Um, no, please. I mean, I think it's amazing. And again, it's super timely and super important. Um, I don't know if we have any more questions. Mm, I think. Anyway, I really hope that people can visit your website. Do you have a website uh, sure. Ernesto, that you can tell us about? Yeah, it's my name, ErnestoSolana.com. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And most, Perfect. Of the most of the works I show are already up there with my contacts. That is great in case people want to see more of your practice. And um, you'll be able to find this entire video in our YouTube channel and our website. Um, um, we had Spain contemporary saying so great to see what you've been working on. So um, I hope people, yeah, Lane, sorry, I couldn't read well. 
I hope that people can uh, see more of your work.